I'm Greg Weaver. Welcome to another episode of The Audio Analyst. After taking you on the virtual tour of my reference system in our last episode and discussing what really exceptional sound I'm able to get uh, here in my room, I received uh, uh, several questions about listening rooms and, and their acoustical interactions. And it occurred to me that uh, I've not addressed this most often overlooked component, your listening room, for more than 20 years now, and that this would be a good time to revisit that topic. You know, most music lovers who have a high fidelity audio system spend a great deal of time researching, reading magazines and books, going to audio shows, listening to other people's systems, um, as well as, as listening in, in store showrooms. But what about the room in which all that gear we have spent so much money and time and expertise selecting will be finally assembled for listening. What about it? I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that very few, if any of you, have taken the time to really even think about the, the crucial integration, let alone given that interface and relationship any real thought. So today we're going to try and develop a basic understanding of the role of that final component, the listening room. Um, and, and we're going to talk uh, a little bit about things like uh, frequencies and wavelengths. Even the finest assembly of gear, cables, and loudspeakers will be held back, unable to reach their otherwise magical potential if the sonic limitations imposed by the room where your system will be set up are ignored. I realize that often uh, the constraints and, and compromises we have to make in our living spaces to accommodate our significant others and families may dictate where we have the space to set up and listen to our stereo systems. But having a better understanding of some physical laws that govern acoustics can only help you achieve the best possible results, whether you are in a position to dedicate a listening space or need to share a part of a living room, den, bedroom, or other multi-duty space in your home. To understand how boundaries, materials, and even the shape of our listening room imposes its signature on the music we try and recreate in it, we have to start with some physics. <laughs> Don't panic. Um, the only math we'll need to do here can be done with a simple calculator. But we do need to understand some basic terminology. Sound is described by the Oxford American Dictionary as the vibrations that travel through the air and are detectable at certain frequencies by the ear. It's also important to understand that sound, sound propagates in all directions from its source, unless prevented from doing so by the presence of something. Um, kind of like the ripples or waves that are produced when you drop a stone into a pond. Now, that analogy is less than perfect because with the pond, we only see propagation in two dimensions, radiating in a circle from the point where the stone uh, entered the surface of the pond, while sound propagates spherically from the point of your origination. And when we speak of sound, we are really talking about frequencies. An audio signal is a complex combination of alternating periodic signals, meaning that they occur at regular intervals, which we call sine waves. The frequency of the signal refers to the number of repetitions, or cycles, which are completed in one second. The greater the number of cycles completed in one second, the higher the frequency. That makes sense, right? That leads us to the term wavelength. One wavelength is described by the distance covered during the period of one complete cycle, regardless of its frequency. As an example, let's start with the lowest frequency attributed to the range of human hearing, 20 cycles per second, or 20 hertz. By the way, that term hertz was adopted in 1960 by the International Group of Scientists at the General Conference on Weights and Measures. Um, it was done in honor of Heinrich R. Hertz, uh, a German-born physicist who opened the way for the development of radio, television, even, even radar, with his discovery of electromagnetic waves during research he was doing in the late 1880s. Now, if the frequency of the sound is 20 hertz, or 20 cycles per second, that means that in one second, our cycle would occur 20 times. The speed of sound, its propagation rate through the air, is given as 772 miles per hour, or for our purposes, the more useful value of 1132 feet per second. Now, these propagation numbers are all based on a standard air pressure at sea level, which is given as 14.7 pounds per square inch, uh, and a standard temperature of 74 degrees Fahrenheit. 
If you live in Denver, Colorado, for example, whose elevation is 5,280 feet above sea level, which actually works out to exactly one mile, hence that city's nickname, um, if it is uh, really hot or cold outside, uh, or if there is a, uh, a weather front moving through your area, you could take those uh, into account. For practical purposes, such deviations are fairly slight, so we're going to use these accepted standards for all our examples here in this video. If we take one second of propagation, our 1132 feet, and divide it by 20 hertz, the frequency we decided to talk about, we can determine that one cycle, or one wavelength, at that frequency is 56.6 .6 feet long. Performing that same computation with the highest frequency attributed to human hearing, 20,000 hertz, yields a wavelength of just 0.68 inches. Now, it shouldn't be too big a stretch to understand that interference occurs when two or more propagating waves arrive at the same physical location in such a manner that they cancel or reinforce each other. These locations, or nodes, where these interferences occur are a function of wavelength as it applies to their phase relationships. So let's go back to our pond analogy for a moment. What happens if we drop two identical stones from the same height into our pond at the same time at two different points? As they both radiate, when one wave encounters the other, they create areas that either splash or don't. Propagation continues, but now the wave characteristics get modified. When two waves encounter each other in such a way that their wave crests line up together, what would be called in phase, that's what's called constructive interference. The resulting wave they combine to create has a higher amplitude because the two waves reinforce each other. That is what we see when we see the splash with our stones in the pond example. With destructive interference, the wave crest of one wave aligns and meets at the trough of another, or out of phase, uh, and the result is a greatly diminished or even completely canceled amplitude. Now, at specific frequencies determined by our room's dimensions, these compressions and rarefications occur simultaneously at the opposite boundary surfaces, uh, reinforcing the waves from both directions. Now, you may wonder why all this stuff might be important. Well, knowing these things in, com in combination with the dimensions of your chosen listening room will allow you to determine which frequencies are going to give you trouble and which ones are not. Let's look into that relationship, okay? In a rectangular room, the three dimensions, height, width, and depth, determine the three primary sets of standing waves, okay? If any two dimensions are the same, it provides more, more reinforcement for that resonant frequency. A cube provides the worst case scenario. It will have one primary resonance with a tremendous peak due to reinforcement from three identical wavefronts. And since there's no way to completely uh, eliminate these resonances, the best way to address these standing wave issues is by selecting an available room with the most favorable overall dimensions. Hopefully we'll be working with three different dimensions, giving us three different primary resonant frequencies to, to deal with. If we could have absolute control over our room dimensions, it would be nice to be sure that none of the standing wavefronts could affect any of the others created by our room's dimensions. But in, unless you're building uh, a new house to your own plans or adding on a listening room to your existing home, this, this won't likely be an option but you can analyze the dimensions of the available rooms in your home. Two primary theories exist on the choice for proper uh, dimensions. Uh, these are the golden ratio and the one-third octave principles. The first option is based on the age-old golden mean first discovered and codified by Aristotle some 350 years BC. It is a dimensional ratio of one to approximately 1.6. Using a real-world standard of an eight-foot ceiling as the one in our ratio, um, the ideal uh, room dimension under this theory would be 12, uh, 12 feet 10 inches wide by 20 feet long. Now, the second theory has gathered great appeal as it limits uh, compound uh, reinforcement throughout the audio spectrum by overlapping reinforcement in one-third octave increments. Reinforcement in, third, in thirds does not permit any even order re, uh, reinforcement, thereby generating the least amount of summing throughout the audio spectrum. Okay? The ratio with this formula is 1 to 1.25 to 1.6. 
using this set of ratios uh, the, and imposing our eight foot ceiling limit as the one, you'll it's a relatively small shroom of 10 feet wide by 12 foot, eight inches long. Now, while this room may be great for standing wave control, <laughs> try to develop any significant base in a room that size. Now, on the upside, any one of our dimensions in the one-third ratio can be halved or doubled without affecting that one-third octave relationship and without seriously damaging the overall smoothness of the room's base response. So a 10 foot wide by 25 foot long room that is eight feet tall would still be quite effective. Whatever you think of either set of these ratios, uh, what is useful is knowing how to calculate the reinforcements in your real world room and when possible, using any methods to tame those uh, accordingly. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so. Let's start by measuring your room dimensions from front to back, side to side, and top to bottom to the nearest inch. Once you've got that, convert that dimension to feet only. So 12 foot 10 inches would become 12.8 feet. 17 foot 5 inches would become 17.5 feet. So the primary fundamental axial uh, resonance for any dimension will occur at a wavelength that is exactly twice any room dimension. Since we have developed a constant for the propagation of sound waves, our 1132 feet per second, and we know that the condition occurs specifically at a multiple of one half the original wavelength, we can use one half of that number or 566 feet per second. Dividing 566 by any of our converted feet only room dimensions gives us the center frequency of that dimension's lowest full length standing wave. Now, obviously standing waves will uh, also occur at even multiples or divisions of the frequency as well, but with less affect than at the fundamental frequency. So a 12 foot long room will experience its lowest full wavelength axial resonance at about 47 hertz, 556 divided by 12. Armed with this information, you can now determine the primary resonance for the three major dimensions in your chosen listening room. When my wife and I were downsizing after our children had moved out, I used all this information to determine which of the houses we were looking at had the best possible room for my needs for a dedicated music system. The home we settled on and are in now was chosen because it fulfilled all our requirements, one of which was my need for a great space for a music system. And the reason I'm presenting all this to you now is to get you to think about the room you'll use for your listening room. An eight foot by eight foot by eight foot den should be avoided like the plague. If you have a couple of rooms that you might use, do the math before selecting one over the other. Often there are considerations which must be taken into account, I get that, but given that you now know uh, the listening room is your most important and overlooked uh, component, you're in a little bit better position uh, uh, to be prepared to make the proper compromises. Choosing the room with the least amount of bad vibe will save energy, time, and money when we try to maintain, uh, when we try to minimize and, and tame those native problems. In part two, uh, we'll talk about the three S's, size, shape, and symmetry. And we'll touch on some ways to manage or tame the remaining concerns within our chosen space. Once again, thanks for dropping by. Um, I hope you're enjoying our conversations, and if you are, please don't forget to like, share, and uh, subscribe. Till next time, take care.